and slaughtered a few settlers. Well, the Nez Perce had always been friendly to the uh, whites. In fact, they get their name, Ne Perce, from mm -hmm. the French traders that came through. It means pierced noses because they wore ornaments in their nose. But uh, anyway, after White Bird's little outburst, uh, Joseph knew he had no choice and he was on the, gonna have to fight or run. So he took all of his men, women, and children, and horses, and everything, and made a trip of about 1,500 miles trying to escape. And they came into Montana, uh, into the uh, Big Hole, at the Big Hole Battle, and went down and down into Yellowstone Park, and then came north. Now they thought they'd get help from the Crow, because the Crow and them had been friends forever. Crow stole about a couple hundred head of horses from them. Anyway, they had the Battle of Cadenyon Creek on September 13th, and then they passed, they crossed the Muscle Shell River, they came north, crossed the Muscle Shell at Rygate, and there's a monument there. And then they camped in Judith Gap. Now, um, Looking Glass uh, was one of uh, Joseph's brothers and uh, and Olicut was another subchief, and they had hunted over here in the Buffalo country. Uh, the, the Laramie Treaty of 1853 had set this up as tribal lands, and all the tribes came here to hunt, including the Nez Perce, because there's no buffalo on the other side of the Great Divide, and they came over here to hunt because there was a lot of buffalo as long as they were strong enough to keep the Pegan yes, from, and the Blackfoot Confederacy from lifting their hair. I got the dog back there for just a minute. And... Uh, dog back there. Oh. Anyway, uh, so they knew how to guide them through the Missouri breaks up to Cow Island. And they, the army came up the Missouri River on paddle boats and met them at Cow Island and they had a treat for or negotiations for about three days before they had a battle and took off. And then Joseph made it all the way up to the Bear Paws on, uh, and they were exhausted. His, they, were, they had nothing left, so he decided to rest for a day or two because um, they called General Crook, who had been chasing them, uh, General Day and a Half, or day after tomorrow, because he was always two days behind them. So they figured he had a day to rest. Well, he didn't know that Terry, or General Miles coming from Miles City had come up along the High Line and cut him off and caught him at the Bear Paws. And that's where the Nez Perce War ended. But because they came through here, we are part of the Nez Perce Trail. And you can see we have, uh, that was July 4th, 1906. So several of those men, well, some of those men, could have fought in the 1877 war. Hmm. This was the year after Custer, so people were a little nervous. Yeah, but Custer got what he deserved as far as I'm concerned. Well, <laughs> Custer was just another egomaniac who wanted to be president. Yep, that's right. Uh, one of the things the Nez Pierce, their lasting contribution to culture is the Appaloosa horse. That was their horse. If you saw an Appaloosie, it was probably a Nez Pierce riding him, unless they'd stole him. Wow, did not know that. Yeah. This is a portrait of Chief Joseph from 1903. His real name was Thunder Coming Across the Mountains. He was called Young Joseph. His father was Old Joseph. But he was, uh, had never fought in major engagements outside of against other Indian tribes. But his tactics for fighting a fighting retreat were so good that uh, West Point actually taught his tactics for years afterwards. Wow. On how to fight a, a fighting retreat to keep your forces and your, uh, the people together and your equipment and everything, minimal losses, and still be fighting battles while the rest are moving back. That's impressive. Yeah. And then we come into this. This is part of Lucas collection. Uh, Lucas was an amateur uh, archaeologist back in the 1940s who lived here. He worked for the railroad during the day. 
and at night, he, er, on his weekends and days off and vacations, he'd go out. He's the one who identified the 21 buffalo jumps that are in Wheatland County. He identified several kill sites. Uh, he's the one who identified Sentinel Rock out here as being an Indian uh, feature. They'd sit up on top of there and uh, flake rock making their arrowheads and stuff while they waited for the herds to come in. They could watch for miles off the top of that rock. Hmm. And then we have a display here setting up how to actually nap stone. Yeah, I used to uh, do some mountain man stuff and we would nap flint mm -hmm. and make arrowheads. Well, not so much flint because uh, North America doesn't have flint as okay. such. Well, we have chert. Oh, is that what it was? Okay. Yeah. Now, chert is like this, or porcelainite. Okay. Now, porcelainite makes excellent, okay. excellent. We were napping at a sort or a obsidian. Obsidian, yeah. Yeah. And actually, you can do that with uh, glass bottles, too. In fact, when really? they. Really? Oh, yeah. When they first started trying to put traffic lights on some of the reservations, uh, they had a heck of a time because the Indians kept taking the lenses and napping arrowheads out of them. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, porcelainite is very special. If you try to work it as it is, when you pick it up off the ground, it just shatters. Uh, but if you temper it, which means heating and cooling, right. then it will flake. But if you cool it off too fast, it goes into powder. So you gotta know what you're doing. But if it's heated and cooled properly, then it makes these thin flakes that are then easy to shape oh, wow. and to your arrowheads. Huh. Neat. Hmm. Now when you look at these collections, you'll see some big arrowheads. Those aren't arrowheads. Those are spearheads? No, they're too small for spearheads. A fighting spear or a thrusting spear had a heavy, long spearhead. They could be up to a foot long. Okay. Now these were technology that's beyond 8,000 years old. The bow and arrow didn't come about till about 8,000 okay, years ago. They were throwing sticks. They used atlatls. Yep. With which the atlatl is actually this thrower. Right. And you'll see this little bump here and that fit into the back of your dart mm -hmm. and it gave you more leverage so where you could throw a spear 20 feet and be effective with this you could throw about 50 yards and be effective that far oh yeah wow in fact uh, up at Olm Pishkin uh, near Great Falls the buffalo jump up there every year they have an annual mammoth hunt where they're using ad modern people using atlatls to throw at, el at a ma mammoth, paper mammoth. These were very special uh, technologically because most, it's hard to find long straight sticks that fly well. So what they would do is they'd have a couple of these and they'd carry a pouch full of these. Oh, inserts. So it's a harpoon. Yeah. You'd throw it, it would pierce the animal. This would fall off. You'd run up, grab it, put another dart in, and throw it again. Sweet. When the Clovis, the Clovis kill site that first was the identifier for giving the entire culture its name, in Clovis, New Mexico, mm -hmm. was full of addle addle darts. One way you can tell an atlatl dart head from an arrowhead is an atlatl dart is going to be over an inch wide. Okay. It's too heavy for an arrow. It's front heavy. It'll tip down and not fly well. So, but for an atlatl dart, because of the weight, it offsets the weight down through, so it'll fly with the heavier head. Sweet. Okay. And now you can see this is the Lucas collection. These arrowheads, knife heads, spear heads, all that. And these were all found in this area around here. Wow. Now, one thing this area is very special for is our basalt. 
Okay. Now basalt is basically lava. Right. And normally it has a lot of inclusions in it and uh, it, it's like this here. This came from over to our west uh, towards the Columbia River. You can see the inclusions and how rough it is. This area has a vein of basalt running from over by Martinsdale. Mm -hmm. uh, and it is so pure that it can be flaked like really? obsidian. Wow. Huh, okay. That's interesting. Yeah. Now these big stone hammers here, these banded hammers, mm -hmm. the reason that uh, I always thought, no, that had to be fake because it's too big. Plains Indians had, wouldn't carry anything that wouldn't fit on their horse. Right. And anything heavy, it had to be very special or they wouldn't have anything to do with it. Those, they would stash down here. They, they used to camp, winter camp down on uh, uh, Lebo Creek. Okay, so they'd use them. They'd stash them. And then in the winter, they would run buffalo out onto ice in the river or ponds or whatever. And when the buffalo couldn't stand up, they'd run up and knock them on the head with that thing. Saved arrows. Makes sense. It was efficient. Yes. That's so cool. Yeah. And then we've got one rock here that uh, for years has had sandstone, which has been worked. Any ideas? Sandstone that's been worked? Yeah. Oh, yeah, look at the hole in the end of it. Mm hmm Hide something in? No. It's actually a weapon. It's a mace. Oh, really? Yeah. Instead of using the ceremonial hammers like this, or mm -hmm. what they would call a whistling rock, mm -hmm. which was a round rock wrapped in rawhide that had a short strand between it, on a handle that would work to yeah. bash in skulls. That one there, you'd shove the, your uh, stick up in the butt, your handle, then wrap the whole thing in rawhide. And it was a mace. Sweet. So you could ride by, clunk somebody in the head and keep going. Yep, exactly. And that buffalo hairball, they used to make, they'd uh, use gallbladders or whatever and stuff them full of hair to make balls so they could have games. Okay, so that's a buffalo hair ball? Okay. Yeah. Wow. Uh, the, uh, they, the girls would play something on the order of field hockey. Okay. With sticks. And they'd bat around a ball like that. Sweet. Not much different than what we do. <laughs> In a lot of ways. Yep. These are some artifacts. Most of these came from the reservations uh, later on. That's why that roach is made of horse hair instead of human hair. Mm -hmm. uh, but the pipestone, that comes from over the uh, western side of the state. Oh, there's pipestone here? No. Oh, yeah. See, I was... Red and green. Huh. I, was, I have a, a Dwight Billadude, um, Blackfoot mm -hmm. uh, friend of mine. I've got a couple of pipes he carved for me, and they, we got the pipestone from Minnesota. Uh, there's pipestone here. Oh, interesting. Yep. But a lot of these dolls and stuff were made for sale to tourists. Hmm. Back in the day. In fact, that little uh, papoose there, that was kind of like a... Uh, Down there, okay. Yeah. yeah. They were mailers from the Skookum tribe. Okay. Like a postcard. Really? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. You couldn't mail anything like that anymore. <laughs> no, no. Now, this is one of my favorites in the collection. That head there. Very distinctive. It is a Folsom. Okay. From the Folsom culture. Uh, the Clovis culture, there were Clovis, there's been the Clovis gravesite found in Wilsall, just on the other side of the crazy mountains. Oh, okay. And uh, it's called the Anzic site, Anzic One. And they're the oldest human remains ever found in North America. And they've been dated to about 15 and a half thousand years ago. Okay. Which is amazing figuring the last ice age ended about 11,000 years ago. Right. 
but no clovis points have ever been found north of the canadian line in hmm. fact most of them are found in tennessee and the del mar peninsula which is maryland even though clovis new mexico where the points get their name was in uh, far away from there they traveled over most of north america at one time up until the um, upper dryas when there was a mini ice age came back and the Clovis culture kind of fell apart. Then the Folsom's showed up. Okay, now is there any Fremont stuff around here? Or? No, not, not really. really. I, I, I read, I've read all of Lauren Isley's books. Yeah, that's more south of That's us. more south of yeah, it's We do have Colorado. Alberta, which is this. Okay. You can see the very distinctive tang mm -hmm. on it. Hmm. Now, these little ones here, I get questions about those. They're like shark teeth almost. Like what? Shark's teeth. Yeah, kind of. But they served a very specific purpose. Okay. They're drills. Oh, neat. So you could drill holes through a buffalo hoof or a deer hoof or an elk ivory or whatever to make your jewelry. The thing of it is, is these are very rare because as small and light and thin as they are, 